slovo, takže to funguje. Dobré, dobré popoledne, přátelé fyziky a komiksu. Je prima, že i na druhé přednášce Jamesa Kakaliose, amerického profesora z University of Minnesota, jsme dorazili v hojném počtu. On je totiž skutečně hvězda, oh my god! James Kakalios. Jim přiletěl do České republiky už po čtvrtý, byl tu, jak vidíte, v Praze před dvěma lety, kdy jsme s ním v Reflexu měli moc pěkný rozhovor a uh, i dnes by vám rád představil něco málo nového o fyzice superhrdiny. Všichni určitě tušíte a víte, že vyšla tato parádní kniha, on ji napsal v roce 2005, Physics of Superheroes, teď ji vydalo v překladu Petra Kotouše na kvalitelství Argo. Oh. <laughs> Bang. Takže byste možná, možná mohli začít, jenom vám krátce řeknu, že James tu včera měl opravdu nabouchánu, dostávalo se mu potlesku jako opravdové superhvězdě a přitom ve finálním te testu, který vám potom možná opět dá pár lidí, tak trochu vypouchlo, takže se soustředte už od začátku a užívejte si to. Přeju vám krásný posled. very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers of Melting Pot and Argo for inviting me out. And I would like to thank you all for coming here today. It's a beautiful day. Saturday morning, afternoon, and you came indoors to listen to a talk about physics. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> Well, I hope that this talk will be entertaining, and if not, at least educational. So, let me uh, begin with a little introduction of how did a mild-mannered physics professor become associated with Spider-Man and Superman. In my day job, I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. Experimentalist means I work in a laboratory, and condensed matter is a fancy way of saying solid-state physics. My research goes from the nano to the neuro. We work on making nanocrystals of semiconductors and putting them inside other kinds of semiconductors in order to make better solar cells or flat panel displays. And I also have a project where I collaborate with professors in neuroscience using techniques we developed to study electrical noise in semiconductors and applying them to voltage fluctuations in the brain. But that's not why I'm here today. <laughs> I'm here today because back in 2001, I created a class at the University of Minnesota that was originally called Everything I Know About Science I Learned from Reading Comic Books, which my colleagues say explains a great deal. <laughs> now, this is a real physics class that covers everything from Isaac Newton to the transistor but there's not an inclined plane or fully in sight. Rather, all the examples come from superhero comic books, and as much as possible, those cases where the superheroes get their science right. Uh, here I show a cover from an old Superman comic that I actually bought when I was a kid back in the 1960s for the grand total of 12 cents. <laughs> I'm very old. <laughs> Uh, I hear Superman was visiting a college campus, and as a kid, I was very interested in what life in college was going to be like. And I knew there were some aspects of the Superman comic that were not right. But there were some parts that turned out to be correct. Namely, all professors at all times always wear caps and gowns, <laughs> and all professors are 800-year-old white men. <laughs> So uh, the class was a success, and then in the, in the spring of 2002, the first Spider-Man movie was about to open. And I thought, well, this would be a good opportunity to get some science into the newspaper. So I wrote an essay about how the death of Spider-Man's girlfriend, Gwen Stacy, in, as you all know, 
Amazing Spider-Man number 121. <laughs> Turns out to be a textbook illustration of Newton's laws of motion. So they published this in the paper, and the University of Minnesota put out a press release saying, well, Spider-Man's on the big screen, but if you want to know about the science of superheroes, the person who answers Professor Chip Kellyus teaches his class, blah, blah, blah. The university has put out press releases about me before, about my work on semiconductors and electrical noise. Result, zero. <laughs> you write one story about Spider-Man, however. <laughs> so the article came out on Friday, the press release went out on Friday, the Spider-Man movie opened on Friday. By Monday, there were calls from the BBC and CNN and newspapers throughout the United States. The Associated Press came to my office where I just happened to have these lecture demonstration tools. <laughs> that was a lucky break. You know, at this stage of my life, I reconciled myself to the fact that I could win three Nobel Prizes and I know what photos are using when I die. <laughs> I say this to my colleagues and they say, win three Nobel Prizes have, like playing dice. <laughs> um, this article actually went around the country. This is a clipping from Chicago that my sister-in-law sent me. It actually went around the world. Here's a clipping from Turkey that one of the graduate students gave me. And then I started showing up in places that physics professors don't usually appear. So there's a popular board game in the United States called Trivial Pursuit where you get these little cards and you get trivia questions. And one day, one of the uh, physics graduate students showed me a card, and I will tell you right now that if you're playing this game, if you get volume six, if you get card 291, I'll tell you that the science question, the answer is cryptons. <laughs> the question is, what planet's gravity did science professor Jim Kekalius estimate by calculating the force needed to leap over an Earth building in a single bound? <laughs> so I didn't even know about this. I borrowed the card and I went down to my department office and I went to my department chairman and I showed him the card and I said, Alan, who's the most famous scientist you know? <laughs> And he looked at the card, and he looked at me, and he said, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> I said, who's not a genius? Oh, well then it's you. <laughs> but comic books actually can get their science right more often than you think. So here's a, a, a few panels from an old world's finest comic book featuring team-ups of Batman and Robin and Superman. And this is Victor Danny, a crook who has become super intelligent through a means I'll talk about in a second. And he wants to find out where the Batman's hideout, the Batcave is. And his henchman says, nobody's ever found the Batcave. And Victor Danny says, nobody with my mental power ever tried. Listen, I want you to bury sticks of dynamite in deep rock outside Gotham City and then set them off. And the henchman says, you mean the shock waves from the explosions can show where the back cave is? Yes. Wherever there's a cave, the wave travels at different speeds. And that'll show up like a big cave like the back cave on my radar seismograph. This is correct. <laughs> Sound waves, shock waves travel at different speeds depending on the density of the material. In the old westerns, if you wanted to know if the train was coming and you didn't hear it, you put your ear on the steel rail because the vibrations traveled faster through the steel than they did in the air. So here is some correct science in a comic book. Sometimes they get how science is done very wrong. Here's earlier in the story, and here's another scientist, John Carr, at a, at a science conference, and he's developed a brain amplifier that could increase any man's mental power 100 times. But there's one ingredient that's still missing and I haven't found out yet what it is. <laughs> now, I can sympathize because I've invented a device that will turn lead into gold and tap water into gasoline. But it's missing one key ingredient. <laughs> and as soon as 
I figure out what it is, I'm off to the races. And then we see in the next panel here, Victor Danny sitting in the back of the room, and he's thinking, if I had that invention and could find the missing ingredient, it could make me super intelligent. Then I'd be able to loot the world. Now, this is what you need to succeed in life. Confidence. <laughs> Just because other people haven't solved the problem doesn't mean you won't be able to. But make sure that you always stay, you use your smarts for good, because we see here, one uninvited guest is present, Victor Danny, crooked ex-scientist. Because it doesn't matter how many PhDs you have, once you're crooked, you're out of the club. And they just <laughs> rip the epaulets off the lab coat and they just throw you out into the street. But I'm not going to try to explain how physics can account for the superpowers, because clearly they're not physically real. And I don't see my job as just going around saying, well, this could never happen, and this is impossible, and what's the deal with the Hulk's pants, anyway? <laughs> Unstable molecules. <laughs> but rather, I grant each character a one-time miracle exemption from the laws of nature. And say, well, if you were super strong, or could stretch like a rubber band, or could run at super speed like the Flash, could you run across the ocean, or up the side of a building, drag people behind you in your way, all things that the character is shown doing, all things that are correct from a physics point of view, once you make that suspension of disbelief. So here we see The Flash, a DC Comics superhero who has the ability to run at super speed. And a crook is shooting at him, but The Flash is faster than a speeding bullet, so this is not a problem. But there are innocent bystanders in the way, and The Flash is not bulletproof, He's not super strong, he's just very fast. But we see here with the sweeping motion, the flash plucked them, the bullets, right out of the air before they could harm him. And then there's a little box here, and it says, Flash's action in stopping the bullets is similar to that of a baseball fielder who stops a hot grounder, a fastball, by letting his glove travel momentarily in the same direction as the ball. Right? And this is a correct use of the flash's super speed. A few days ago, I picked up an object going 1,000 kilometers per hour when I poured myself some soda on the airplane. It's going 1,000 kilometers per hour. I'm going 1,000 kilometers per hour. There's no problem. If I'm standing still and it's going 1,000 kilometers per hour, then I got a problem. So this is some correct science. Okay? Here we see um, another part of science. The flash is trying to write to run at the speed of light, and he's finding it difficult. <laughs> and he's thinking, it's taking me a little longer than usual to reach light velocity. I wonder if I'm tired or something. That could affect my super speed. Good gosh, there's no doubt of it. I'm slowing down. I'm going slower and slower, despite all my efforts. I can't go any faster because I'm getting heavier. Something's happening to me. Now, those who know Einstein's special theory of relativity know exactly why the flash is getting heavier as he tries to run at the speed of light. An alien is shooting him with a gravity increasing red. <laughs> but if you take it out of context, it's a beautiful illustration of Einstein's principle. Now, this may sound like a very silly premise, but there's actually something serious that I'm trying to do here. It will no doubt come as a surprise to all of you, but some of my students actually find physics dull. <laughs> I know, I know, I felt the same way. <laughs> this was illustrated to me when I overheard two students leaving the physics building. I'm going to repeat exactly what I heard, but in respect to melting pot, I will clean up the language. <laughs> the taller student said to his friend, I'm going to bleeping by low and bleeping so high. I don't need to know about no bleeping balls thrown off no bleeping clips. <laughs> now, I maintain that there are three nuggets of wisdom 
contained in these two lines. The first, of course, the secret to financial success. <laughs> so, if you get nothing else out of this afternoon's talk, at least now you know, buy low, sell high. <laughs> That's what I've been doing wrong. <laughs> Okay, the second, for those of you who are scholars of grammar, will have noticed that bleeping can be both an adjective and an adverb. <laughs> well, I think some of you already knew that. And then, of course, the third is that many students don't find their introductory physics classes relevant. And this is illustrated in the standard student's complaint, when am I ever going to use this in my real life? Interestingly enough, whenever I use superheroes to illustrate physics principles, students never wonder where they're going to use this in their real life. <laughs> Apparently, they all have plans after graduation that involve spandex and capes, and knowing, as I do, how many crony ex-scientists there are out there, that's probably a good thing. But the the, the superheroes are there simply to illustrate the physics principles. Once we've talked about the physics principles, I can show how they do apply in real life, from everything from how airbags save lives in automobile crashes to how cell phones work. So I will give you some examples today, and I hope you're so busy enjoying this superhero ice cream sundae that you don't notice that I'm getting you to eat your spinach at the same time. <laughs> So the first thing I want to talk about is this, the article that I wrote about in the newspaper that started this, this um, adventure for me. And I talk about Spider-Man and the principle of conservation of momentum and address the question of what killed Gwen Stacy. Um, Spider-Man, created in 1962 by Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. Steve Ditko just passed away um, last month at the age of 90. Stan Lee is 95 and still going strong. Uh, they tell the story of Peter Parker, a high school science student who is bitten by a radioactive spider, does not get radiation poisoning and die, <laughs> but rather gains a set of fantastic powers with which he fights crime as the Amazing Spider-Man. The story that I want to talk about was published in 1973, and in this story, the Green Goblin, one of Spider-Man's foes, has kidnapped Gwen Stacy, Spider-Man's girlfriend, and brought her to the top of a bridge in order to lure Spider-Man into battle. During the fight, Gwen is knocked off the top of the bridge where she falls to her apparent doom. Spidey shoots his webbing down after her and manages to stop her at the last moment, though, though those with good eyes will see a little snap sound effect by her neck. It's going to have bad consequences in a moment. He brings her back up to the top of the bridge where he discovers to his horror that she is in fact dead, even though he caught her in the webbing. And this was a big deal, a big deal at the time, still is a big deal. It was the first time that a long-standing long -standing recurring character, an innocent bystander, died when the hero and villain fought. And it's also very significant because it's been over 40 years now and Gwen Stacy is still dead. <laughs> In comic books, no matter how you die, you eventually get better. <laughs> but Gwen belongs to this small group of characters who've never quite recovered from their death. Um, and then the Greek Goblin starts taunting Spider-Man, by the way. He says, romantic idiot, she was dead before your wedding reached her. A ball from that height would kill anyone before they struck the ground. Which, if that were true, the implications for skydivers and <laughs> bungee jumpers would suggest somebody's not telling us the truth about something. But this has been a long, open question. And in fact, um, in the year 2000, Wizard Magazine, a monthly magazine for comic book fans, listed this as one of the great open questions in comic books. Was it the fall that killed Gwen Stacy or the weather? They put this at the same level as who's faster, Superman or the Flash? <laughs> the Flash. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could use physics to address this question. We'll use Newton's three laws of motion. The first law of motion is that an object in motion remains in motion 
until acted upon by an outside force. The second law is that if there is a net outside force, then there's a change in motion given by the expression force is mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the rate at which the speed changes. And the third is that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. You can't push on something without the something pushing back on you. Forces come in pairs. So we can actually use this to address, I is mad, close the doors. <laughs> we can use this to figure out how much force is exerted on Gwen Stacy by the webbing. First, we want to find out how fast is she moving when she falls off. We will use a very, very simple equation that you all know. Distance is average speed times time. You all know this. If you drive for an average speed of 100 kilometers per hour, and you drive for an hour, you've got 100 kilometers. Right? That's easy. So what do I use for average speed, though? Because she starts off with zero. She just is dropped. But then she gets, goes faster and faster due to gravity. Well, I know the start is zero, and the final velocity is v. I don't know what that is. But if I have two students in my class, and one gets a zero, and one gets a hundred, the average grade is 50. So I'll do the same thing. I'll just add those two and divide by two, and that'll be the average speed. The time is how long it takes a constant acceleration due to gravity to speed up from zero to v. So that could be written as v over the acceleration due to gravity, g. You do a little bit of algebra, and you get an equation that the velocity times the velocity, or velocity squared, is two times g times h. So, we assume that she falls 100 meters. That seems about right for the tower. We know what the acceleration due to gravity is. That's 9.8 meters per second per second. We go on Wikipedia and we look up the value of two. And we find that when the webbing reaches her, she's going to 43 meters per second or about 150 kilometers per hour. Now, to figure out how we're going to change her motion, we have to use force equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is change in velocity over time, so we'll bring time over here. This is force times time, which in physics we call impulse. Mass times change in velocity is something in physics we call the change in momentum, which we represent by the letter P, because it stands for momentum. <laughs> Rocket scientists. Come on. <laughs> so we know what her change in velocity is going to be. She's going to go from 150 kilometers to zero, because it stops her. If we say her mass is 50 kilograms, seems about right. If we say the webbing stops her in half a second, then the force it has to exert is 1,100 pounds, or equivalent to, to a deceleration of 10 g. And this is the part that does not require suspension of disbelief. You tell someone they were going 150 kilometers per hour, you stop them in half a second with a force of 10 Gs, and they go, yeah, and they die. Right? Yeah, I know that there are fighter pilots or astronauts that can withstand these, these forces. They tend to be in chairs with neck support. And this is why we have airbags in our automobiles. You're going, say, 100 kilometers per hour, and you hit something. So your car stops. But you keep moving forward, because an object in motion remains in motion. You're acted upon by an outside force. That outside force is coming up in a moment. It used to be supplied by either the steering column or the windshield. Those are very rigid, so the time of interaction is very short. So the force is very large. Look, you're going 100 kilometers per hour. You go to zero because you hit something. You don't want that, you shouldn't have hit something. Your mass doesn't change. That's the best case scenario. <laughs> That's what we're shooting for. No change in your mass. So this part is governed by the collision. And so here, your best bet to decrease the force is to increase the time. And airbags do two things. They spread the force over a larger area. And they deform under contact. They give. It takes a little bit longer to slow you down than if you hit a brick wall, hitting a mattress. 
And so instead of one millisecond, maybe it takes three milliseconds. That doesn't seem like much. But that's three times longer time means three times smaller force to get the same change in momentum. So a, in that case, a collision that would have killed you now will merely knock you out. So sadly, the same physics that saves our lives in automobile crashes is responsible for the death of Gwen Stacy. I wrote a letter to Wizard Magazine describing these calculations. They published the letter and they said, see, physics shows it was indeed the webbing that killed Gwen Stacy. And then a few years later, in Peter Parker's Spider-Man number 45, the Green Goblin is still taunting Spider-Man over the death of Gwen Stacy, but now he's changed his tune. Now he says, I tried to save poor Gwen, but before I had a chance to reach her, Spider-Man did something incredibly stupid. Despite the speed of her fall, he chose to catch her with that rubber levee things. In the next instant, her neck was snapped like a rotten twig. So, it may have taken 30 years, but at least now the Green Goblin realizes that it wasn't the fall that killed Gwen Stacy, but was in fact the webbing. I don't know how well I do with my students, or the readers of my book, or with you here all this afternoon. But if I could teach a homicidal maniac like the Green Goblin about Newton's laws of motion, then I'm making a difference. <laughs> And I just discovered, a few weeks before coming out to Melting Pot, the perfect illustration, the perfect superhero to illustrate um, uh, conservation of energy. So I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but let me talk about PEDAC <laughs> and <laughs> conservation of energy. Okay, did I say that all right? Is it okay? Yeah. Great. Um, so you probably know more about him than I do. Uh, the Parak has these special spring shoes that enable him to jump great distances with which he tormented the, the Nazis during the war. And um, we can use this to illustrate conservation of energy. Now, what is energy, really? In physics, we consider energy to be the ability to cause motion. So either you have, you're already moving, you have kinetic energy, in which case you can cause motion if you collide with something, or you, there's a force acting on you that would accelerate you, but you're being restrained, you're being held up, and so you have potential energy. As soon as the restraint is removed, then you have the potential to cause motion to move. So you think about a rock balanced at the top of a mountaintop. It's not moving, but it has a large potential energy because it's, but it's being restrained from moving by the top. As soon as you tip it over and it starts moving down the mountaintop, it converts that potential energy into kinetic energy. And if you ignore friction and air drag, which are just other forms of kinetic energy, then the kinetic energy at the bottom of the mountain has to equal exactly the potential energy at the top. So we can, um, when we think about Pera, when he jumps, he, he starts off and he converts the, the potential energy of the, of the compressed spring into kinetic energy, and then he lifts up against gravity and he converts that kinetic energy back into gravitational potential energy as he rises. So his kinetic energy is converted back to gravitational potential energy as he climbs. Physicists have a technical term for this. They call it jumping. <laughs> so, don't need to worry about the equations, but the, the potential energy of the spring can be written in by one half k x squared. X is how much the spring is compressed. K tells me, is the spring constant, tells me how stiff the spring is. Is it, is it really hard? like a, a, a sofa spring, or is it nice and soft, like a toy? The kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared, and then as he climbs up, his gravitational potential energy is his mass times acceleration due to gravity times how high up he goes. 
So, let's analyze Perak as he leaps a tall building. He starts off with potential energy in his frames that gets converted to kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is converted as he climbs to gravitational potential energy. So if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And so the we just we don't even need to know how fast he was going when he lifts off. Turns out it's about 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, but the potential energy of the spring leads to how high he can climb. So let's figure out what kind of metal is in those springs. Well, when he climbs up, let's say he has a mass of 80 kilograms. Let's say he leaps 10 meters, and the acceleration due to gravity is 10 meters per second squared. That means that his gravitational potential energy is about 8,000 joules at the top. That has to come from the potential energy in the spring. If the spring gets compressed by 15 centimeters, then that means that the spring constant, K, has to be 700,000 newtons per meter. Now, is that a big number or a small number? That's a big number. I went through and I started to look at where, what kind of spring, what kind of, what kind of steel would that be? I couldn't find it. The steels are only about, at most, 30,000 newtons per meter. And I looked through and I couldn't find any other metals that would work. So I have to conclude that Para was using a very advanced material. <laughs> and I think I know what it was. Maybe adamantium. <laughs> Now I can tell who's a comic book nerd. <laughs> so perhaps instead of calling him Perak the Spring Man, we should call him Perak a man ahead of his time. <laughs> so the next topic I want to talk about involves electricity and magnetism. And I usually do this when I discuss the two supervillains, Electro and Magneto. And while I get a drink of water, I will let you think about this and see if you can figure out which villain is associated with electricity and which one with magnetism? <laughs> Give up? Okay. So Electro is a Spider-Man villain who was, he was kind of like a rough guy who was up on a power line when he was struck by lightning and thus obviously gained the ability to store electric charge and discharge it at will in the form of lightning bolts. Um, you know, as a kid, I could probably be forgiven for thinking that getting hit by lightning was the greatest thing that could ever happen to me. <laughs> Second only to wallowing in radioactive waste. <laughs> I'd be stupid not to do this. <laughs> but here we see, in the first time uh, Electro fights Spider-Man, Spider-Man deflects one of his lightning bolts by tossing some small bearings into the air. And then he deflects another lightning bolt by tossing a metal chair overhead. And Spider-Man says, anyone with any knowledge of science knows that anything metal can act like a lightning rod, excuse me, as this steel chair is doing. Well, actually, Peter, Anyone with any knowledge of science knows that this is true. If the chair were grounded and there were some place for the electricity to go, I, I, yeah, it can act like a lightning rod. If you put a lightning rod on top of the roof of your house and you don't connect a wire down to the ground, all you've done is come up with a quicker way of making, setting your house on fire. Water goes from the faucet to the drain because of gravity. It's not attracted to drains. It's not like if you put a drain on the ceiling, the water goes, there's a drain, Arca! It's like, but gravity's no, forget gravity, there's a drain, I'm going for it. It doesn't work that way. It gets even worse the next time Spider-Man fights Electro. He really is confused about grounding because now he deliberately attaches a wire to himself. <laughs> and he picks 
Good thing I drowned myself. <laughs> I'm able to take the full effect of it thanks to the addition of my spider strength. Spider strength helps, but really. <laughs> if you're fighting a villain with electric powers, don't do this. Now it's interesting, this is Spider-Man in 1962. Superman in 1938 has a better understanding of electrical gravity. So here is from scenes from Action Comics number one, June 1938, Superman's very first adventure. In the story, nobody knows who Superman is, nobody knows that he has powers and abilities far beyond that of mortal blood. And so Superman wants some information from this guy. And the guy looks the way Superman's dressed with these, um, this blue unitard and the red cape and wearing his red underwear on the outside. And he decides to not cooperate. So Superman grabs him and jumps up and starts running along a uh, telephone wire. And the man panics, saying, stop, stop, we'll be electrocuted. No, we won't, says Superman. Birds sit on telephone wires and they aren't electrocuted. Not unless they touch a telephone pole and are grounded. Whoops, almost touched that pole. <laughs> By the way, I see that look in class a lot. <laughs> but Superman is exactly right. You want to know how to take a glass of water that's filled up to the very top, no lid, no cap, no layer of ice, and turn it upside down and keep all the water in the glass? Do it underwater. No place for the water to go, it'll stay in the glass. I can be at 10,000 volts. If everyone else is at 10,000 volts, I don't have a problem. If there's one person that's at zero volts, then I have a problem. So it's the same idea here of uh, Superman understanding electricity. Now, even in the same issue where Electro gets grounding law, he gets something else right. Here, is earlier in the story, and he's just got done robbing a bank. We know he's robbing a bank because he has a big canvas bag with a dollar sign on it. <laughs> you may have a different opinion on this, but personally, if I gained mastery over one of the fundamental forces of nature, I don't know if these are the clothes I wear in public. <laughs> this is just one of a series of bad decisions that lead these guys to a life of crime. And then he runs out of the bank and he scampers up the side of the building like Spider-Man. And these two people are talking and say, look, that strangely garbed man is racing up the side of the building. And the other person says, he's holding on to the iron beams in the building by means of electric rays, using them like a magnet. Incredible. Now there's several things to note here, of course. How come no one uses the phrase strangely garbed anymore? Two, younger people in the audience may not remember, may not know, but back in the 1960s, pedestrians used to routinely narrate things that occurred in front of them, <laughs> talking out loud, providing exposition for anyone who happened to be walking by. <laughs> and three, this is a physically correct use of Electro's powers. Be, having electric powers requires a miracle exemption from the laws of nature. But if you did have electric powers, then you could use them to create magnetic fields. Electric currents create magnetic fields. I know this because I read comic books. <laughs> so here's an old Superboy adventure about Superman when he was a teenager. And then a group, of, a gang has broken into an army base and has stolen these tanks and are just riding around town in these army tanks. And so Superboy could just fly around and pick up the tanks, but he decides to turn this into a science fair project. And he says, I'll need that locomotive, a dynamo from the powerhouse, and a few miles of wire. This dynamo will give the current I need when it's hooked up. Now for the windings. A few seconds to wind these miles of wire, and then I've got the biggest electromagnet ever made, and one that can go places. Lucky this railroad runs right through the town. Ah, there are my vandals. And sure enough, the, the tanks are attracted to the, to the uh, train, 
and inside the tank they say, what's happening, we're flying. It's that locomotive. It's a magnet drawing our steel tanks, ignoring the steel cars. <laughs> And then he's dealing with the buildings. And, well, it's very directional magnetism, very comical magnetism. But if you talk about magnetism, you need to talk about Magneto, the mutant master of magnetism, one of the X-Men's first and deadliest enemies. Um, and here we see Magneto. He can create magnetic fields outside of his body. And so here's one of the X-Men, Angel. And Magneto polarizes some iron in this boulder and uses it to throw in the angel. And then in another story, uh, when Magneto's plan has been foiled, he runs up, he escapes, and he starts flying. He says, I can still escape you, flying by means of magnetic repulsion. So the question is, what does magnetic repulsion mean? I know about magnetic attraction. So if I take a paper clip, and the paper clip is not magnetic, but I put it by a magnet, it's attracted to the magnet. And what happens is that the paper clip gets polarized by the magnet, magnetically polarized, so that it develops a south pole next to the north pole, and south and north poles attract, so the paper clip is attracted to the magnet. But not all metals are magnetic this way. Some metals are what's called diamagnetic, and they would develop a north pole facing the north pole. And since the North Pole and North Pole repel, it would be pushed away from the magnet. Um, and if this magnet is strong enough, that repelling force can be actually greater than the weight of the object. So as I said, not all metals are magnetic. Some metals are diamagnetic. Silver is diamagnetic. Gold is diamagnetic. So if you go home tonight, and you're able to pick up your gold jewelry with a magnet, you might want to check to see if there's any chocolate inside. <laughs> and then you might want to talk to somebody. <laughs> uh, water is diamagnetic. And since we're mostly water, so are we. So presumably, Magneto is using, creating a magnetic field that diamag diamagnetically levitates himself when he flies away. I don't know if you can create a magnetic field strong enough to levitate a person. But I do know that you can create a magnetic field strong enough to levitate a frog. Because if you Google diamagnetic levitating frog, <laughs> and who hasn't at some point, the first thing that shows up is this, so we're ready for the movie, if you could do it is this video, and we'll see if we can get this to play. We have some, we have some um, problems, but let's see. Yep, there he is. And that's not on the space station, but that's in the Netherlands, in a magnetic field of about 200,000 times the Earth's, thank you very much, that was great. Uh, 200,000 times stronger than the Earth's field but the frog was levitated by diamagnetic levitation. You go to the, you should just Google diamagnetic levitating frog. It'll take you to the site and you see levitating strawberries and, and everything, it's great. Um, so, in the last few minutes, I, want, I don't want to leave you with the impression that absolutely everything in comic books is 100% scientifically accurate. So I want to tell, talk about those few rare cases where they will get their science wrong, even with the miracle exemption from the laws of nature. So we're talking about the X-Men. Another member of the X-Men is Cyclops, who has a mutant superpower of shooting force beams from his eyes that are held in check by a special visor that he wears and presumably his eyelids. And here we see, in a training exercise, he's knocking a teammate into the wall. But do you see what's wrong with this from a physics point of view? What happened to Newton's third law of motion? If every action has a reaction, when Cyclops exerts a tremendous force on his teammate, his head should be moving backwards. 
at 700 kilometers per hour. <laughs> Therefore, Cyclops must have two superpowers, force beams from his eyes, and exceptionally strong neck muscles. <laughs> Um, here's another thing that comic books get wrong. Here's again another scene from an old world's finest comic book with Superman and Batman and Robin. And here in the story, Superman is carrying um, <laughs> uh, an orphanage a bunch of, uh, from one part of town to the other. I don't really know why. <laughs> but you know, he's always doing stuff like this. He's picking up buildings, he's picking up ocean liners, he's picking up jet planes. Buildings are not meant to be picked up. <laughs> Even if it's like this orphanage that's apparently not connected to any city water or power. <laughs> and even if you hold it under the center of mass, there would be these enormous twisting forces called torques that would make the thing crumble under its own weight. Think about having like a long, long piece of bread and you've got like all this heavy fillings in the bread and you balance it right underneath the center. Even if it doesn't rotate, at some point the ends are going to get so heavy that the whole thing will fall apart. You can't keep it supported. The building should crumble. Instead of getting to where he's going with a bunch of cheering orphans, <laughs> you, could, you should get there holding a few, a few bricks and some piping. And you can always tell where Superman's been by the trail of construction material that he leaves beyond. But as bad as this is, it gets even worse a few issues later, where here he's now carrying these two office towers like pizza pies. And that's not even the weirdest part of this. The weirdest part is what he's saying. I got permission to borrow the two Gotham City buildings you asked for. Who would you ask? I mean, who would you ask? You go to you, I'll, uh, I'll be there, too careful. I'll use one hand. <laughs> okay, Superman. I mean, when he first appeared in 1938, people fled in terror when he lifted a car overhead. Now it's like, yay! Superman's going to kill us all. <laughs> but the last, the last character I want to talk about is a DC Comics superhero, one of my favorites, the Atom. Uh, and the Atom has the superpower that he can shrink down to subatomic size. And I really mean subatomic. In one story, the Atom and a friend have shrunken down and they're having a very private conversation as they sit on an electron. <laughs> and I have so many questions. <laughs> and at one point, the friend stops and turns to the atom and says, we're smaller than oxygen molecules. How are we breathing? <laughs> and the atom gives a great answer. He says, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I love the atom. He's one of my favorite characters because in his secret identity, he is Ray Palmer, physics professor, <laughs> who was trying to develop a shrinking ray and was unsuccessful because it was missing that one key ingredient, which turned out to be a chunk of white dwarf star matter. Okay, who knew? So, we see here, in, as told in uh, Showcase Comics number 34, that was published in 1964, here's Ray Palmer, physics professor, finding the chunk of white dwarf star meteor, and he's thinking, so heavy, I can hardly lift it. Puff. I don't know the odds against one white dwarf hitting another out in space. Puff. But it could happen. And when it did, this piece drifted until it landed in this field. White dwarf stars are dense because they're formed of degenerate matter. Puff. Matter from which the electrons have been stripped, greatly compressing them. Well, the electrons are in there, but they're in the lowest quantum states. It makes the atoms very, very rigid. Um, they, it is called degenerate matter, so that part is correct. <laughs> By the way, in the 1960s, all professors drove Cadillac convertibles. So, that part's right, too. Um, but it is very heavy because it is very dense. If water has a density 
of one gram per cubic centimeter, and lead has a density of 11 grams per cubic centimeter, then white dwarf matter, white dwarf star matter, has a density of 3 million grams per cubic centimeter. <laughs> so if we assume that this rock is a sphere with a radius of 15 centimeters, then we can understand why Ray Palmer is huffing and puffing. <laughs> because that little rock weighs over 50,000 tons. <laughs> now I have to say that this is actually, technically, not a blue book. And that is because we physics professors are just that strong. 